So we're very fortunate today to have Rosalind or Roz Brewer as our special guest. Uh, she is the CEO of Walgreens, um, Walgreens Boots Alliance. Um, but I call it Walgreens, but Walgreens Boots Alliance. Uh, previously, she's a native, uh, I'll go through her bio briefly, but we'll talk about it as, during the course of the interview. But for those who don't know, uh, she's a native of the Detroit area, went to college at Spelman and been the chair of the board there for 10 years. Yes. Began her career at Kimberly Clark, 22 years there, was recruited away to go to Walmart. At Walmart, she later became the president of uh, Sam's Club, did that for five years, then recruited away to Starbucks where she was the chief operating officer for four years. And then in March 21, she became the CEO of Walgreens. Pretty nice career. So. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So let's start about talking about uh, Walgreens for a moment. I have noticed that Walgreens and a, another company that's also in the drugstore area, I won't mention their name, but a, but a competitor of yours, uh, both of you seem to be interested in being in the healthcare business as opposed to the pharmaceutical drugstore business. Why is that? What's, what's so much better about the healthcare business? Yeah. So, you know, first of all, I'm really glad to be here in the DC area. So thanks for having me, David. This is, this is, um, this is wonderful. Um, so first of all, you know, we've been, Walgreens started in 1901. And, you know, when you think about drug dispensing, it's, um, it's critical to all of us at some point in our lives. But one of the things that's very clear to us um, ending the pandemic or in the middle of the pandemic, we realized our relationship with our customers and our patients was so much more critical. We delivered 70 million shots in arms during the time of the pandemic, but the relationship just went to the next level. Pharmacists have always been consultants with customers and patients, and you will see your pharmacist 10 times more than you see your primary care physician. But the idea of having a primary care physician interacting with the pharmacist is the way of the future. And we will, we will need that ecosystem around us. Okay, so in your case, um, Walgreens case, you have begun a business, you've bought a lot of companies in this area that are primary physician companies. In other words, That's right. you buy uh, the practices of primary physicians and then in effect those doctors are working for Walgreens and they are still serving their patients, but they're in effect employees of Walgreens, is that right? That's that's correct. They're, um, so we are purchasing, we just purchased Summit Health in the New Jersey, New York area. And um, now we're one of the largest primary care physician practices in the country. So primary care physician practice, um, What? how many people in the United States are the 330 million people we have or so, how many of them actually have a primary physician? From what we understand, less than 30% of Americans have a primary care physician. Okay. And you think it's good to get an annual physical every year? I know you're not a doctor, but- No, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> but you know, I will tell you that you know, we're all gonna be responsible for our health, both financially and managing our own care. And to get a physical every year is a good uh, database for you, a, a baseline to build for yourself because it's gonna fall back on you. You need to know more about your personal health right. so that you can interact effectively with your primary care physician. So I get an annual physical every year. I try to starve myself for the two weeks before the annual Yes, physical. I have mine tomorrow, yes. I, I have found it doesn't work, but okay. Um, so let me ask you about the pharmaceutical business, the drugstore yes. business. Um, COVID brought a lot of people into the drugstores to get their COVID shots, I guess. Has a business picked up or gone down since COVID has more or less waned a bit in terms of people getting shots? You know, what we're seeing at Walgreens is that we created, you know, an expanded relationship. Um, it did start with immunizations, but now people are very deliberate about their flu shots. And so they're still getting COVID shots. Uh, today, vaccines today, and they're getting flu shots in combination. Um, our retail business, if you look at our prior earnings, is is up uh, and performing well, um, especially as we transition into healthcare, the front of our stores are, are picking up. So when it was announced that you could get your COVID shot at a drugstore, uh, your competitor or uh, Walgreens, initially, I thought the person who does the checkout was the person who was going to give you the shot. I didn't know. I think who was going to give me the shot? I didn't think that person really knew how to do it. He was checking out uh, my supplies or when I was buying things. But it turns out it's the, it's the pharmacists that are giving it. Right? Yeah, it's, it's the pharmacists and uh, pharmacist technicians that, that are there. And so, yes, it, and, and a pharmacist is, you know, in, in certain states, they're qualified to both test and treat. And so they're uh, 
tons of examples of like, say for instance, you are you do test positive in our stores. Um, in certain states, our pharmac pharmacists can then prescribe your antiviral for you so that you don't have to go and have a secondary doctor's appointment in order to get the prescription for Paxlovid or others. Now, it seems as if roughly two thirds of Americans have uh, gotten COVID shots, but the other third seems very resistant to getting it. And now that people are talking about getting another booster shot, it seems as if a lot of people are not going in to get these additional booster shots. Is business dropped off a lot in getting COVID shots now? We're still doing COVID shots. Um, you know, I would encourage everyone to get vaccinated because I think what we're seeing is that you are, your recovery period is you re rebound a lot quicker if you've been vaccinated. And so we're really encouraging people to still get your vaccinations and get your boosters. And it's never too late to start. Um, that's the important part. So we, um, and especially as it expands into pediatrics. Now, what about flu shots? Should everybody get a flu shot? Yes, everyone should get a flu shot. I always say get a flu shot by Halloween. And, you're, you should hey, be and can you get a flu shot and a COVID shot at the same time? At the very same time. They can do, they can. Okay. So, uh, but uh, the COVID <laughs> shots and flu shots are free to people like me or anybody else. You get, you go in, you don't have to pay. But do you get paid for providing this service to people? I assume the government pays you something. There's just, yeah, there's. But it's not a big profit item. Okay. So I notice in a couple of drugstores, even in my area, which is not the poorest area in Washington, D.C. It's a nice upscale sort of area. Um, when I want to get razor blades, you have to go to the front of the place and ask somebody to unlock it. Why, why are you locking up razor blades and other things that I might want to buy? Yes. So, you know, this is a national problem. And, you know, this isn't, you know, uh, random theft. This is organized crime. And, you know, state legislation has put guidelines on you know, how much you, you know, the theft that, that uh, you, you can steal before you're convicted. So it's a thousand dollar limit, but we have been partnering with other retailers and sharing our camera feed. I know um, some of our partners here from Walmart are here, but we're all part of an organization that's coming together that says if you've, you know, we can put our camera feed together and tell that that person has been in our store and their store and the numbers are higher than 1,000. So we've been able to impact these uh, theft rings um, most recently. What are the things that are unlocking key the most? What are people trying to steal the most uh, <laughs> other than razor blades? I guess. You know, I will tell you, um, I actually it started at razor blades because that's such a high ticket item, but um, you know, it's a lot of uh, cosmetics, but really what happens is that um, they take advantage of what I would call the elbow move and they just come in and swipe a counter. And so it's just a matter of categories now almost and not just particular. So I read that post COVID, it's difficult for um, companies like yours to get entry level people to come in there. They either don't wanna come back into the workforce or they don't want the job that you can provide them. Is it hard for you to get people? I notice in the stores that I go to, the drug stores, they're always fresh people all the time, new yes. people. Yes, you know, there's a lot of turnover at the hourly level, I, I, I will admit. Um, but as we have these conversations, it's becoming less about pay and more about their lifestyle and what they want to do and progression. And so what we're encouraging is that, you know, work at, at a Walgreens store and you can become a shift manager and escalate. And that's really what they want to think about as a, a career and development. So if you were an entry level person at one of these stores like Walgreens, uh, what kind of compensation do you get? Is the more above the minimum wage, but you pay like $15 an hour or something like exactly, that? Exactly, exactly. And then it moves up based on, you know, shift manager and other responsibilities in the, in the building. So I've noticed that uh, in the, a lot of the stores I go into, it used to be younger people post-college or something who were the younger people working, servicing the uh, drug, drug store. Now I see a lot of people who are older, like, like post-retirement kind of people doing it. Is that um, a phenomenon? You, you know, we, we see both, um, you know, on the younger end of the spectrum, it's those looking for development or fill-in job while they're in college and doing something otherwise in their lives. And then the retirement community is a very, um, you know, rich environment for us to recruit from. So what is the most profitable high margin thing that you all sell at your Walgreens? Is there, is there anything? You know, I'd have to say it's in our cosmetics area is, um, is one. And then in some of our durable medical goods, some of our um, take home testing and things like that are, are very nice margin items. So I, I'm not buying a lot of cosmetics, but um, <laughs> I do notice when I walk down that aisle to get to the razor blades, um, um, <laughs> You know, you have all this airtight packaging, but you smell the cosmetics or the 
whatever it is. Why is it the packaging is so airtight, you still smell this? Is that on purpose? No, it's not. It's not on purpose. It just, you know, happens to be, you know, what's interesting is, you know, our customer likes to come in and, you know, yes, the packaging is airtight, but, you know, there are mavens for cosmetics in our business and they will just, you know, come in as enthusiasts and spend some time there. So you may smell some products that they've looked at. So oh, the most common thing that somebody buys at a drugstore, what is that? What is the most common, most frequent thing that you sell? Most frequent thing is probably um, toiletries like toothpaste and personal care items. Okay. Those, those types. And why is it that whenever there is like a scare coming along or a pandemic or something, people rush to buy toilet paper? Um, <laughs> you notice that? People are just, they're, they're stockpiling toilet paper. It's is that called a hoarding. hoarding. And okay. it's one of those things you never want to be without. Okay. <laughs> so for people that, people that are buying uh, prescriptions, if you go to a prescription, what is the most common people, a thing that people get as a prescription? Uh, prescription. I would have to say, you know, diabetes in this country is, is really prevalent um, in all ages. And so I would say insulin is probably one of the most really? predominant prescriptions. Okay. So let me ask you what it feels like uh, to be in your situation. Is it more disappointing or surprising that of all the uh, CEOs in the Fortune 500, there are only two female African-American CEOs, only two. Right. You and the CEO of, uh, of, of um, Teachers is the only other one, I think. Yes, TI. And so mm -hmm. are you surprised that at this late date in our history, we only have two or yeah. disappointed? Well, um, I'm more disappointed than I am surprised. Um, I'm not surprised because I know what it took for me to get here. And I know the trials and tribulations that I've been through. And, um, you know, I'm not quite sure um, a lot of people would want to withstand that. But I would tell you that the disappointing part is that um, this is just, it's, it's totally ridiculous that there's only two of us. Um, I think, you know, it's going to go beyond mentoring and sponsoring. It's it's um, pipeline, you know, filling the pipeline effectively, getting um, people of um, different races in operating roles um, and having the confidence that, you know, that they can do it because they absolutely can. Okay, so let's talk about Walgreens itself. How many Walgreens stores are there in the United States or around the world? Yeah, in the United States, there's 9,100 stores in the United States. And the biggest one of them all is? Is in Chicago, the in the Wrigley Building. Which is where you're headquartered. Yes, was. we're headquartered in the Chicago suburbs. And so the store, as everyone knows, the Wrigley Building, um, it's a multi-level store. It's um, it's a fantastic building. And it really, you know, there's so many um, hotels, so it really uh, supports the travel industry. And okay, and so the total number of employees is roughly? We're roughly at about 350,000 employees. Okay, and is it mostly in the U.S.? I know there's a big yes, British. Yes, mostly component. in the U.S. We um, we're actually Boots. Um, most people know the the brand Boots is part of our business, and we operate um, that in the U.K. And then we have some small units in Germany, and in China, and um, small units other outside the U.S. Latin and America. So the business of uh, running a, a drugstore chain is that. Uh, high margin businesses that are low margin business by and large, would you say? Well, you know, I would say that our business is a little bifurcated. I mean, you know, we run a traditional retail business up front and, you know, a, a retail food, um, what I'll call a grab and go business is, you know, never exceeds a three to 4% margin. Um, but then, you know, a different margin structure when you combine it with the pharmaceutical business in the back. So do you prefer that people check out on these automatic machines or you prefer that they go to a cashier? Because <laughs> because when you have check out yourself, sometimes people could steal something. How do you yes. make sure they don't do that? You know, I my my view on that is that I like to meet the customer where they are. You know, if they are in a rush and want to go through a self-checkout, you know, we, we trust that they're going to do the right thing. And, you know, we have parameters in place uh, to monitor that. There's not a lot of pilferage from that. No, no, our pilferage comes from what we talked about before. Okay. That's our biggest. Every time I try to do the automatic thing, it doesn't seem to work. I always have to call the person. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're one of those. It's the light coming on. <laughs> it always seems like uh, it says, call your attendant or something, or the attendant will come help you. It's David. I don't know what it is. It must be me. I, I don't know, but I don't seem to be able to get to work it. Okay. So um, let's talk about your background for a moment. Sure. I mentioned earlier you're from Detroit. Uh, your family, how many siblings do you have? If ever? I have three sisters and a brother. 
-hmm. Okay, and you're the youngest? I'm the youngest of five. Okay, and are any of the others running drugstore chains? <laughs> no, but I do have a sister that's a pharmacist. Wow, is she yes. at Walgreens or? No, she's not, no. Oh. We don't want to mix. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, all right. So you're, you're, what did your parents do? So both my parents are, are, are deceased, but my parents worked in the auto industry. And so my dad um, eventually worked as a member of management and my mom worked in um, hourly labor. At, uh, okay. So you, you can go to many good colleges. You went to Spelman, an excellent college in Atlanta. Why yes. did you choose Spelman? Well, I chose Spelman because, you know, I grew up in Michigan. I wanted to do something a little different, um, get out of the cold weather. But it was also a chance for me to be at an institution that I thought really reflected me, who I was and what I wanted to do. And I think also, too, I mean, I, I got a scholarship. And so that was helpful being at the time there were four of us in college. And so um, I was actually pursuing, you know, support at that time, too. And what did you major and what did you want to be? I majored in chemistry. And I thought, you know, I had always been pretty decent in the math and sciences. So I just did what I knew what to do. And I thought I'd either go into medicine or engineering. Um, and actually I was recruited away by Kimberly Clark to work in long range research as a chemist. So I, I so moved you, in that you direction. thought you might go to medical school, but Kimberly Clark stole you away. Right, okay. Right. So yeah. what did you do for 22 years at Kimberly Clark? So I started off in long range research as a, as a chemist, I was an organic chemist, um, and I had interned um, my summers at General Motors. And so I worked in chemistry there. I worked in analytical chemistry, I moved into organic, worked in polymer science, and then I worked in um, on one of the businesses. I got a chance to join the M&A team probably about six years into my career. And um, at the time, it was when Kimberly Clark was converting itself from a paper company to consumer products company. And we acquired several companies and I got to run one of those companies and I just stayed on the business side after that. Okay, so you're doing that. You're there 22 years. You're happy, presumably. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, somebody calls you up and says, how about working for Walmart? What did you say? No. No. <laughs> on the first call, I said no. Um, probably the first, second and third call, I said no. Um, you know, if initially they were speaking to me about a job in human resources, and I really don't have that skill set. And so um, once an opportunity came on, came about that had a P&L to it, I, I joined the company and I, I was group president at Kimberly Clark and I took a VP regional job to run the state of Georgia. Okay, so you're at Walmart and then somebody calls up and says, how would you like to run Sam's Club? Is that right? Yes. Well, a lot happened in the first five years where <laughs> um, I ran Georgia, the Southeast, then the East Coast of uh, Walmart stores. And then um, I was a candidate for the Sam's Club job. What's the most popular thing that people buy at Walmart? I would say paper towel. Paper towels? Yes, absolutely. They're private label brand. I have to say it's pretty good. And um, do people ever complain to you that something's out of supply or out of stock? Or what was the biggest complaint that people make at Walmart? At Walmart, absolutely. Um, out of supply. You know, people own their Walmart. They'll say, this is my Walmart. And this is how I want my Walmart to operate. And so, you know, we, um, I have to applaud the company um, because they do everything for their customer as best they can. And so you customize it. And, and what I did like about the model at Walmart, if I could just say for a minute, is that they gave their store managers the leverage to customize their store and, you know, work in their communities. And I, I really, I was highly attracted to that. What's the biggest complaint that Walmart customers have? They, something's out of supply? or Something's out of supply, or it may be an issue with, um, usually it's supply. You know, they want what they want. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you're minding your business. You're running Sam's Club eventually, right? Right. You did it for five years? Yes, I did. And Sam's Club, I can't say that I'm a big participant in Sam's Club. I don't really know. It's a subscription kind of Yeah, membership. it's a membership model. And um, it is, you know, 650 units at the time when I was running it. Um, almost closely um, a $60 billion business. And it is a membership model, roughly $100 a membership. So it was interesting because your customer becomes really important to you in a membership model because, you know, you pay to shop there. So it, 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 I always felt like, you know, membership should have privileges. So we really focused on the customer and what their needs were. What can you get at Sam's Club that you can't get at Walmart? 
large bulk items. So paper towel on steroids and <laughs> the like, multi-pack of everything. Like so, Cos Costco or something similar, like that? Similar, yes, like Costco, but I'm still, but I still love Sam's Club. Yeah. Okay. So. All right. So uh, you're doing that for when people come in, they buy gigantic amounts of paper towels. I mean, yes. a year supply or something like that. Well, here, here's the history of Sam's Club. You should understand is that, you know, it was initiated to really fulfill um, you know, the um, 7-Eleven stores of the world, the convenience stores. And so it was set up to support the business proprietorship. So if you had a small unit, you would come buy your bulk items at Sam's Club and resell. So that's why the pricing is so effective at Sam's. And um, But eventually it became more of a 50-50 split between people like ourselves shopping there and business owners. But we would fulfill, we would be same day inventory for many restaurants. Okay, so you're there for five years. You're the CEO. It's a pretty good job, I guess. Where you work? Where, where were you living to do that? I was in Bentonville, Arkansas. Bentonville. Okay, mm -hmm. you're in Bentonville, and all of a sudden, I guess another headhunter called you up and said, "How would you like to go to Starbucks?" Is that right? <laughs> no, actually, I made the decision to leave uh, Walmart stores, and um, I was on the board of Starbucks, and I had taken the um, the board seat as I was leaving Sam's Club. And so I had a conversation, attending a board meeting and uh, Howard Schultz and Kevin Johnson approached me to become the chief operating officer. And you said you don't really drink coffee or you didn't say that? <laughs> you know, I, I was a tea drinker at the time. So that was interesting. Um, <laughs> and Seattle wasn't in my um, plans, but um, I did, I, I fell in love with the brand and the company. Um, I saw a great opportunity for um, to help the company operate a little stronger. Okay, so you moved from Bentonville to Seattle, and you yes. became the chief operating officer of Starbucks. And Starbucks has become so successful because its coffee is better than other people's coffee, or what is the reason you think it's so successful? I think it's two things. I think it is um, definitely quality coffee. It's uh, customized, right, for all drinking palates. Um, I also think that it's their coffee practices along with the baristas in the store. I think the baristas are top notch and really interact great with the customer. What's the most popular thing that people ask for when they go to Starbucks? Is it? Oh, gosh. They, you know, really just a simple pike, um, is, which is a, a black coffee, um, is still very popular at Starbucks. Okay. The cold beverages are really, you know, trending. So. Okay, so you're there, you're doing that for four years, yes. and all of a sudden, I assume a headhunter calls you again? Yeah, now that was a headhunter. All right, a headhunter calls you up <laughs> and says, uh, how would you like to run Walgreens? And you say, I'm happy at Starbucks, or what? I, I say, I think about it for a minute, because um, I, I really, I was enjoying Starbucks. Um, I, you know, wanted to be there, and um, didn't really think of myself you know, coming back into that level of retail, but it was the pandemic and there were so many people dying at that point and people who were adverse to uh, being vaccinated. And I knew for sure, because I follow the science on things, you know, my background is in chemistry and the science just screamed, you know, that if a vaccine became available, we could curtail this. But death. Starbucks, you have a perfect name for that brewer, right? So yes. did they ever mention that to you? That <laughs> You know, I got that all the time. Okay. Um, you know, everything was what's brewing and all these, uh, yes, hashtag everything. So yes. the, what did you, when you told Howard Schultz you're leaving to go to another company, what did he say? <laughs> Actually, I had that conversation with Kevin first. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant. Um, I, I, I think the, the board was a little surprised, you know, but we made it work. So do you ever go to Starbucks now? Every day. Oh, every day, yeah. okay. Yeah. You ever go to Sam's Club every day still? Yes, not every day. I buy, I bulk right. up and- Loyal. Yes. Okay, so now uh, you have this job since March. Uh, what's the biggest surprise of being the CEO of Walgreens? You know, I think the biggest surprise to me was how complex healthcare is and how um, unfortunate it is to try and manage you know, personal health in the health systems that we've set up in this country. And um, it's, it's, it's perplexing. I think that this marketplace is ripe for disruption and I'm sort of drawn to um, transformation and disruption. So 
I became super excited about it once I began to peel back the understanding of the business. Right. So you're the CEO of a healthcare company, in effect. It does. Yes. Um, you, you have the physicians business, and you also have the uh, pharmaceutical business. What do you do to stay healthy? Because you have to be a role model, right? You can't look like you're not healthy, right? So how do you have to exercise yeah. a lot or what? Yeah, well, first and foremost, you know, like I said, my my, my health exam is tomorrow morning. I'll be heading back to Chicago to, to get that done. So I, I take care of myself in that way. I like supplements. So, you know, I'm, I, I take my vitamins um, daily. And then I will tell you that I work out three or four times a week as best I can. And so I... I okay. I, I make it a priority. For well, I think about working out three or four times a week. Yes. And I actually don't yeah. do it. The thing I haven't solved, though, is sleep. And I think that's our biggest opportunity. If I get sleep down, maybe I can lay off of the supplements a little well, bit. Well, um, you're supposed to get eight hours of sleep a night. No way. No, you don't get eight no hours. Way. Okay. So um, today, uh, what do you think the biggest healthcare challenge is for Americans? Is it that we're overweight, we take too many drugs. Uh, what, what is the problem? Yeah, so I think it's it's two pronged. One is that yes, obesity is a big problem, um, but I think it's 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 negligence, but it's not intentional. I think people are confused about the cost and access of healthcare, and they think it's going to cost them a lot. Um, and when people have variable employment, as we've seen across these last several years, is that you know they're not quite sure what their insurance will cover and and not cover and what their out-of-pocket expense will be. So they avoid going to the doctor. And I think that is something we've got to bring clarity to, which is why, you know, the digital side of healthcare is going to become very important so that we can all look at our mobile devices and understand what's going on with our bodies. So you're running a global company. In effect, it's more than the United States. Yes. So how do you do all the travel you have to do. You're, you're traveling half the time or, my, or something like that? Yes, I travel quite a bit. And, um, you know, because of my retail background, I go to stores a lot. I, I love to um, I love to walk in stores. So if you walk into a Walgreens today, would they know you? It depends. If I worked out that morning, no, because they don't recognize me. But um, sometimes no, sometimes yes. Um, and sometimes I can hear them say that I'm in the store. You know, I can hear oh. them chattering. So when they say, yes. so you walk into a store though, and if you don't like something, you call the manager and say, this isn't good. Or do you just kind of tell them when you get back to the office? So really what I do is I take a picture of it and I send it back to my team at the office and say, I wonder why this is happening, right? Because usually it's a decision we've made that is causing something to happen. Nine times out of 10, it's something we've done versus what the store has done. So your competitor, principal one is CBS, I think probably the largest competitor, some people would say. Um, if, I, if, I, if CBS is right here and Walgreens is right there and I could go to either one, why should I go to Walgreens over CBS? I could pick either one. What, what, why are you better than CBS? So glad you asked me that question. The, um, you know, I believe our customer experience model is um, stronger. I think that um, when you walk into a Walgreens store, you may not have this happen to you every time, but I think you get a nice greeting from our cashiers, and I think our pharmacists are second to none. Okay, and to be a pharmacist, is that a job where people tend to do it their entire career? Do they leave, do something else? Well, we have many uh, members of our management that are pharmacists, and so they come into our corporate um, entities, um, and um, so they can migrate through the company. And so we do have, you know, um, progression for our pharmacists. How do you make certain that the pharmacist isn't maybe taking a little pills off to the side and maybe, you know, giving it to himself or giving it or selling it? You have, you have well, controls to make sure that all your pills we, are we there? We do have controls. We have controls on our inventory. Um, inventory management is, is really key. Um, there are cameras in our stores. And so we monitor that very, very effectively. Oh, so if you need a prescription, do you have to wait in line? Or do I you, do. I have to wait in line. You wait in line? I do. You ever say, I'm the CEO of this company, I'm waiting in line? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, but usually there's not um, too much of a line. So but I, and, and I know the, the best hours to show up too. Sure. Okay, so as we talk today, you're in Washington, D.C. Yes. I presume you're here to meet with government officials to some extent. Uh, do you find that an uplift, uplifting experience when you do that? You know, I find, I, I find um, quite a few teachable moments for both of us. You know, I try and bring the real life experience of healthcare to legislation so that when the right um, decisions are in front of them, they make great decisions. So what is the principal thing that the, let's say the drugstore industry would like to have the Congress do? 
you know, first and foremost, you know, I would love to see our pharmacists to operate at the top of their license. And so for them to pass legislation that will allow pharmacists to both test and treat so that there's not a second step in, you know, just imagine a mom who has to take a child out of school and take them to pick up a prescription only to find out that the child is still sick and go back to the doctor. So if it's an ear infection, strep throat, we can do a test in the store to figure out and then pass on the prescription and, and the recovery period is smoother. Do you need legislation goes, for that? We absolutely do, yes. Okay. And do you meet people from the administration as well? or? I do. You know, most recently, um, there's members of Senate that um, are primary care physicians. And so I, I know who they are. So I meet with them regularly because they understand us best and help us carry the, me the message, you know, throughout. So the average person who goes to a primary care physician in one of your facilities, how long are they there? Is it an hour or two hours, 10 minutes? How long? No, they're usually there somewhere between 20 to 25 minutes, which is really um, a little bit longer than if you were in, um, you know, some other. And what's the most center. common thing that people come in for? Usually it's something respiratory, um, you know, especially right now. Um, that's usually an ongoing thing. Or usually most people are monitoring a, a chronic issue. So where maybe diabetes and high blood pressure are coming together and there are issues around uh kidney issues and things like that. So it's just a combination of more than one thing happening to them. So in your career, what has been a bigger problem, being a female or being African-American or neither? You know, I would have to say being African-American. Um, I think that um, it is still, you know, a an issue in our environment to accept people of different races more so than it is gender. Um, I, I think I've seen a lot of progress with women in, in corporate America, and I'd like to see more progress with people of color. So when you are in a board meeting or a nonprofit or other kinds of organization, are you often the only female, or often the only African-American, or often the only female African-American? Yeah, so that's a good question. Usually, um, usually the only African-American female for absolutely sure. Um, and, um, and then secondarily, I would say African-American. Um, I look at our board. Our board is approximately 50% women. Really? The board of Walgreens. Mm -hmm. But you're not discriminated against men who are qualified Absolutely and want to not. be on that board, right? It's 50%. So okay. the other 50% are men. Okay. So I think that's fair. Okay. So um, you're obviously you've had an incredible career. Your parents, did your parents live to see your success? You know, it's interesting. Um, if I could describe my dad, my dad would define my success as what I did in my, you know, throughout my education. My dad was that father that showed up to everything. If I was getting the yellow ribbon and not the gold ribbon, he was still there rooting me on. So he really knew who I was as an individual. You know, he, uh, we talked about that a lot. Uh, he passed away six weeks before I finished Spelman. And, um, he, he, we had conversations. Um, he saw something in me and he let me know that. So I think he is looking down. I think he kind of knew something good was going to happen. My mom definitely lived through a good part of this. Um, and then my siblings are sharing in, you know, the, the excitement in our family. But your siblings, you were the youngest, your siblings uh, say, well, when we were beating you up, we didn't really mean it. Or, oh yeah. The oh, days yeah. my brother would, yeah, right, right. The days my brother would throw me across the room. Yeah. Thanks. But we're very close now. Right. And they have to wait in line for prescription. <laughs> so um, today, uh, when you look at the, the American health care situation, uh, would you say the Affordable Care Act has worked reasonably well or not so well? Or what would be the major improvements, if any, that you would like to see in it? You know, I think that the Affordable Care Act was, it hit at a very good time. And it was what I would call a pivot in the right direction, because now the conversation you know, the Obama administration studied health care and they brought to light the problems of health care. And so now it's 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 clear. And the in the outcome was the ACA. And I think it was a good start. And I think there's some components of it that are still, you know, existing today. And then we're looking for next generation. But I think it was it was the right decision at the right time. And it opened the eyes of many. So when you need to get health care checkup or something, do you go to one of your primary physicians that is owned by Walgreens or do you go to another doctor you have for a long time? I, I have a, a relationship that I've had for a long time. Okay, so you don't want to tell him to sell his practice to Walgreens? <laughs> 
not yet, but we'll see. <laughs> so today, um, you know, you obviously have an incredible career and you're still very young, but certainly by my standards, you're very young. So have you ever thought about going into government, running for office or uh, cabinet or something like that? Absolutely not. Why? You want to serve your country? I would love to serve my country, but on the other side of out, outside of the um, as a taxpayer. I'll, I'll, yes, I'm fine being a taxpayer but, and, and influencing in any way I can. But I, I, um, I find um, I've been very effective in my role in having good conversations in the seat that I'm in. So, so if the president of the United States called you up and said, I'd like you to be secretary of something or another, you would say. I'd have to think long and hard, to be honest with you. OK, so maybe you might consider it. <sighs> You're not looking for it. Not, no, that, no, I wouldn't sign up for that. OK. No. So uh, you have some children. Your children are they interested in the healthcare business? No, they're they're not. They're not interested in healthcare um, businesses at all. Um, I have a son who's um, you know in the in the corporate environment, and I have a daughter in college. Okay. Yeah. And do they look to you for advice all the time and say, well, um, you know, you're doing this right or you're doing this yeah. wrong? Or ten text messages a day from each of them, but sometimes <laughs> a lot of it doesn't have to do with corporate it's all over the board so for some people you're obviously a role model for young uh, women or young african-americans or for anybody what would you say is the key to success in rising up the corporate world that you would advise people they should do you know i really advise people as i'm mentoring them is that you know is to look at these roadblocks as opportunities because you're going to have them and i I, sometimes I get a little frustrated because, you know, some will, you know, people that I mentor believe that this is like a conveyor belt, like it's just easily going to happen. And, you know, sometimes you have to look at, you know, in my career, I took probably three lateral jobs and probably maybe even more uh, setbacks financially just to get the development. You know, like I said, I left Kimberly Clark as group president and came into Walmart as a regional vice president, but you know it was important for me to learn a new skill set, and I I hope that this generation is patient enough to make those decisions. Okay. Now, sometimes headhunters have called you and said, "Would you be interested in this job or that?" If a headhunter called you now for another corporate job, you're no, I I would not. I I I really truly think this is the culmination of everything I've done in my life is is coming to bear right now. This is what I want to do. Um, I'm being, we're being very intentional about impacting medically underserved communities. That's important to me. So you're finishing up your 10th year as chair of Spelman's board. Yes. So what's it like to go to the college and become the chairman for 10 years? And um, what are the biggest problems that college students have at a place like Spelman these days? One is affordability. Um, the cost of higher education is escalating. And so I would say that affordability is, is one of the issues. And then second, if I look at this point in time right now, we have what I will call the pandemic um, teenagers attending college right now. And they had a lot of social and emotional um, impacts. And so many college campuses are addressing that with increased counseling because it's, it's, it's real. Okay, so your company is more in the U.S. than anywhere else, but are you trying to expand it outside the U.S.? I know you have the English uh, part, yes. but are you, what about Asia, Latin America? Are drugstores in Asia, Latin America, Europe much different than they are in the United States? Yeah, they're, you know, just because the healthcare regulations are different around the world, that it does impact how you dispense um, meds around the world. And, you know, you look at our Boots unit, and I would say it's more of a cosmetic and beauty company um, that happens to have pharmacy aligned with it. So I think you'll see us become more of a US-based healthcare company um, over time. Uh, we've been very transparent about you know, the potential uh, sell of the boots business, which we attempted in the last year or so. Um, and due to you know, capital markets, we pulled um, away from that strategy for now. So the, the uh, outlook for the industry you're in is reasonably good? I mean, you think people are going yes. to keep buying the kind of things you're selling? I, I actually do. You know, I think that healthcare is going to be local. Um, the majority of our stores, 90% of our stores are within 15 miles of the household. And so access to um, pharmaceuticals, and then eventually we'll have 3,000 what we call health corners in our stores. Those are um, areas in our store where you can just come and talk about your healthcare needs. And then we'll have the, the Village MD portion. So we'll have points of care 
in at least 50% of our buildings um, in the future. So is the most important thing for people who want to go to a drugstore, is it access to uh, being close to where they are live or is it the price? Is price more important than access or? So I would say convenience is first. And I think the relationship with the pharmacist is, is, is second. Um, they spend a ton of time once they're, you know, you leave a doctor's office and you have an early diagnosis of something, you leave there in a daze. But by the time you're handing that script over to that pharmacist, the reality is setting in and you begin to ask the real questions. And our pharmacists have to be able to answer those questions. And so I know you can't talk about price competition and antitrust related things, but prices seem to be almost the same at Walgreens and at uh, CVS. Is that just, there's only a limited amount of, you can charge for these products or does it seem to be relatively the same? Well, I, you know, I think, you know, there's market pricing for a lot of, you know, commodities. And so I think we probably fall in the, in the same line. I mean, if you look at, you know, your, your customer base and, you know, you, you price according to, what your customer can bear. So back to my razor blade phenomenon. Um, I noticed so if you want to buy really nice razor blades, they're locked up. But like they have these little things where you can buy 20 at once in a little plastic bag, which are, I guess, not the best ones. They're not locked up. So should I conclude they're not as good or nobody wants to steal them? <laughs> they probably don't have a lot of good resale value. Yes. Oh, yeah, sure. that's the way okay. to think about it. Yes. Okay, so what's the greatest pleasure of being, other than doing interviews like this, the greatest pleasure... <laughs> The greatest pleasure of being CEO of Walgreens? You know, I think um, for me, the greatest pleasure has been this transformation we're in to become a healthcare company and really thinking about the needs of most Americans and taking care of themselves is, gives me great joy, you know, to think that we might possibly be able to turn the corner on health outcomes and the cost of healthcare and create new relationships that are uncustomary. You know, the idea that a drugstore now, you know, owns primary care physician practices is, is, is novel. And um, I hope it answers and responds to, you know, the growing inequities in healthcare. And what will you hope ultimately your legacy to be when you retire 40 years from now? Mm -hmm. 40 years from now, you could still be young enough to be president of the United States, right? So imagine that. <laughs> so what would you like your legacy to be? You know, I hope um, that people can talk about, you know, the opportunity they had to work at Walgreens. Um, I am, you know, I was that person that was low on the totem pole that needed to escalate. I hope that people can talk about what their experiences were as an, as an employee. I really would okay. hope so. So I'm going to go to my local Walgreens today and say, I just met with the CEO and she said it was okay to, to buy this at a discount. And she said, uh, <laughs> And she said, I don't have to stand in line and things like that. She said that. That's okay. You won't mind. Yeah. Just let me know which store you're going to. Okay. I'll, I'll try right. and call ahead. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much for interesting you, conversation. Dave. I have a little gift for you. Oh, thank you. David, that's not little. This is a oh, that's map lovely. of the District of Columbia. Wow. Okay. That's that nice. Yeah. Thank you.